Welcome back to my YouTube channel. My guest today is prosecutor Michael Ben from Miami, Florida. And with Michael today, we'll talk about spree killer Andrew Cunanan and uh, the murder of uh, Italian fashion stylist Gianni Versace. Thanks for your time, Michael. Thanks for joining me today. Happy to be with you. I will remind you once again, I am a former prosecutor. I haven't prosecuted for quite some time. Well, okay, yes, you're definitely right. I just wanted to make it uh, a bit shorter. Uh, before we start, can you explain us what your role in the investigation back then in 97 was? Yes. Um, at that time, I was the chief assistant state attorney. Essentially, it would be the number two in the office. My area of concern was primarily homicides um other matters but primarily homicides uh the office got a call actually my assistant received a call from the city of miami beach um explaining that uh mr versace had been shot um she immediately ran into my office i was engaged in something else um explained to me what happened uh, I popped out of my office, uh, looked down the hall, so one of my uh, senior assistants, uh, Rosemary, and I said, Rosemary, drop what you're doing, head straight for Miami Beach, uh, keep me in the loop, let me know what's going on, and once I conclude what I am working on, I will join you uh, over on Miami Beach, and that's essentially how it evolved. Okay, so this is a pretty peculiar case because Cunanan's murder spree started all of a sudden. Like these guys lived pretty much a normal life for 27 years. In your opinion, what triggered something like that in his mind? I'm not sure he lived a normal life. And, and by that, I mean, I apologize. No problem. Let me shut this off. Um, I apologize for that. No uh, again, I'm not sure he led a normal life. I would describe a normal life. People get up, they attend school if they're of a certain age, or they get up, they go to work, and they support themselves. Uh, Cunanan, in my estimation, never led a normal life where he really got up, supported himself. He depended... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Blanche Dubois, on the kindness of strangers, he depended upon other people to, to support him. Um, I think uh, uh, his life was starting to unravel. Uh, his source of income or his source of support, more accurately, um, was starting to fail. And uh, this led to issues, I think, uh, psychological issues, psychiatric issues, uh, which led to a breakdown and uh, in an effort, I think, to find support, uh, he went to see folks he knew and then uh, it degenerated from there. Um, so again, I don't think it was a normal life. What the actual trigger was on the psychologist or psychiatrist, I don't know for sure. But I think uh, we witnessed an individual whose life was unraveling very, very quickly. Oh, but do you see many cases like this where a person doesn't kill anybody? At least we can say that it doesn't kill anybody for 27 years. And then all of a sudden it kills uh, four people in two weeks. Well, you don't see these cases that often. Uh, most homicides are a result of a robbery gone bad. Uh, a domestic issue. Uh, there's generally some motive you can place for, I dare say, the vast majority of homicides. The more puzzling cases, uh, the serial killers, either they, they take advantage, for instance, we had this recently in Miami of an individual who was killing homeless people. Um, and we saw that actually also in California as well. We have rape murderers who engage in the crime of, of rape and then they kill uh, their victim. This is one where whatever 
deficit in his mind led him down this path. This, again, what I'll describe as an unraveling of his life uh, causes. But it is a somewhat unique or a situation that's an aberration. It's not the, by any stretch of the imagination, a normal homicide one might see. Well, something that is very peculiar in Hunano's case, at least for my understanding, is that he killed five people pretty much for five different reasons. Because he killed Jeff Trail out of an argument, probably. Then he killed David Madsen because he had to, to protect himself. Then he killed Lee Miglin for the fun of it. Then William Reese to steal his car. And Johnny Versace probably again for the fun of it. Do you see many cases like this in which serial killers uh, switch reasons? Uh, again, most serial killers, they have a motivation, whether it's the homeless people they want to uh, kill, um, or it's sometimes it's sexually related. This case, again, was an aberration. The first individual he killed, there was some relationship there. The second case, you indicated he had to. Who knows why he did? I think they were both uh, robberies trying to get his means. Uh, the, the older gentleman, Minklin, in Chicago, uh, again, it was to get money. Uh, the caretaker in New Jersey was to steal his car. And, and honestly, um, why... He killed Johnny Versace is speculation. Um, whether or not uh, he, it was a coincidence uh, where brought two folks together, I don't know. I mean, as I stand here today, I'm not sure if I can identify a real motive for the death of Mr. Versace. Well, and my last question goes hand in hand with another one. He used very different methods too, because three times he used the gun. In one case, he used the hammer, and in another case, a screwdriver, a hacksaw, and duct tape. Do you see many cases like this in which a serial murderer uh, uses so many different uh, weapons? Uh, somewhat rarely. Uh, generally, they use a knife, for instance, and it's the same knife they use. Um, sometimes they use a, a weapon, but again, I think the first two homicides uh, were related to the stealing of a weapon. So um, I'm not convinced that uh, had he escaped Miami Beach and gone on to other occasions, he probably would have used uh, the handgun uh, that he was able to get his hands on. You already said something about Versace, but I would like you to elaborate. Why did he choose Versace? They had totally nothing in common. Moreover, he had like more than two months to think about it because Lee Miglin, uh, William Reese, was killed more than two months before Johnny Versace. Right. And again, um, he might have known that uh, Versace spent time in Miami, but it's, again... Versace was certainly a gentleman of means and uh, to be traveling anywhere at any time. So it was somewhat in my mind that if he had planned this trail of homicides to wind up here in Miami um, with the end game of killing Versace, it seems to me that um, it probably doesn't not very likely. Remember, this is the 90s. This is before the era of social media where you can almost track people. Oh, he's here at this club. He's here in this city. That wasn't available. He knew that Versace owned a place uh, on Ocean Drive in Miami Beach. Um, did he feel that after killing four individuals that the end was near and he wanted to be remembered and that in in some regard, may have fit some profile of his. He wanted to be somebody. Uh, he wasn't anybody. By killing Versace, he became somebody. Incredibly sad for um, the Versace family and uh, Mr. Versace, obviously. Um, so it's, it's hard to guesstimate because he was never interviewed. 
um, from Murder One to Murder Five and uh, never seemed to speak or share with anyone his motivation. Uh, so we're left guessing as to why he was killed. So Versace is definitely his most famous victim, but to me, he's not the most mysterious one, I would say, because Lee Miglin is far more interesting because I, I totally don't get it. Did they know each other, as far as you know? Or... Uh, you know, as far as I understood, no. Um, that uh, would uh, save the first two victims. I don't believe he knew Mr. Miglin, didn't know the caretaker, did not know uh, Versace. Um, and happenstance, coincidence, he met uh, Miglin in Chicago or happened upon him at, uh, maybe after he ditched his vehicle and, and saw an older gentleman, maybe viewed him as vulnerable, um, and, and took advantage of the situation. But what, I, I, okay, I get your point, but what surprises me is that he covered his face. He covered Lee Miglin's face. Does, doesn't this mean that he recognized it was a real person, not an unknown person? Um, again, you're trying to place a normal, rational persona onto Cunanan. It's, it, it's incredibly difficult to do that um, because he wasn't normal. He wasn't uh, rational. And why he did one thing vis-a-vis -vis something else, there's no reason uh, to guess. Okay, that's a very that's a very good answer. So this investigation was very widespread because it covered at least five different states. Did this make things more difficult for you guys? Uh, in some respect, yes. We often speak about organized crime, and there is organized crime. Uh, rarely, he sometimes, is law enforcement so organized. Uh, however, in this case, I reached out to the prosecutors in Minnesota, the prosecutor in Chicago, the assistant United States attorney in New Jersey handling that case, and I spoke with everyone. And I asked them to send to me their files so we could start to dissect this because I firmly believe eventually uh, Q9 and would have been caught. And, and literally the day before or the day of, I guess, it became known that Q9 died, I had organized a meeting in my office here in Miami with uh, the prosecutors from Minnesota, Chicago, and New Jersey to sit down, dissect the case, see how we might aid one another, and essentially say, okay, if he is caught, what's the batting order? Um, who's going to go first? Who's going to go second? How are we going to align our different prosecutions uh, toward an end that would satisfy um the ends of justice to, to satisfy that uh, we wouldn't be stepping on one another's toes. We could reach agreement uh, on who would go first. I mean, and candidly, in my case, um, if I went first, I'd only have one murder. Uh, that's not a death case, um, you know, basically with, with one murder. If, however, I went second or third and he had been convicted of other murder, that becomes a death case. Um, becomes a, what is called here an aggravating factor if he has a criminal history, particularly a violent criminal history. That certainly was uh, of moment. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, we wanted to get, or I certainly wanted to get law, uh, law enforcement aligned so that we would work in concert and we wouldn't um, wind up with any adversarial positions. So this guy, Andrew Cunanan, uh, spent two months running from law enforcement agencies. And then after killing Versace, he buried himself in a houseboat. Why did he do that, in your opinion? Um, I think he was out of options. He had very little money. Um, he knew that law enforcement uh, had become aware of him. Uh, where was he going to hide? Uh, he didn't have a vehicle at that point. 
He had a weapon if he wanted to, uh, to take a vehicle, but uh, I think he became very leery of that. He found a place where he could hunker down, hide, um, and he felt probably relatively secure in that houseboat. Definitely makes sense. And okay, let's get to the main topic. You entered that houseboat. I did. I did. I was uh, right after the uh, uh, after the SWAT team uh, made entry. Uh, I was on the scene. It was literally five minutes of that from my house. It was uh, straight across the canal. Uh, uh, you'd find uh, from my home, you would find Versace's house. Uh, I'm not on the water, but uh, a block uh, a block off and, and and I went into the house it wasn't the first uh, uh homicide scene I've seen having been a prosecutor here in Miami for some 20 years uh I've been to any number of homicide locations I've been working hand in glove with law enforcement uh with this case and when I arrived I spoke with the lead um uh, investigator, well, we chatted. Uh, he had made entry, uh, saw it, asked if I was interested. I said, yeah, let me just see it in my own mind. And I uh, I entered it, uh, saw how he was splayed on the bed and the gun next to him. And um, I had work to do. We had the crimes, the mobile crime scene unit out there. I needed his fingerprints. I needed it because at that point, you know, we knew of QNAT and we didn't have prints. So uh, I directed law enforcement to get prints, um, send it to California. Uh, I also wanted uh, as quickly as uh, crime scene could evaluate the scene, take photographs. Um, I wanted them to secure the gun, get it to a ballistics expert so we can start making comparisons uh, of the bullet with the other homicides where a gun was used because we we had that information and, and uh, law enforcement did that and we knew fairly quickly relatively quickly uh that cunanan was in fact andrew cunanan from his fingerprints and we were able to match the ballistics uh with the other homicides was the house both messy like or was it ordered? How would you describe it? it? It would not. I would not describe it as particularly orderly. Um, it had been, as I understand it, uh, an abandoned uh, houseboat. And nobody had been living there for a while, and it looked like no one had been living there. I mean, the, he was on a bed. The bed was messy. The inside of the houseboat was ramshackle i guess it wasn't uh it wasn't totally out of order um you could walk about it wasn't stuff uh, just thrown about uh but uh it, it was not a place i don't know if it even had electricity so um i'm not sure off the top of my head my recollection is that it was just you know he was able to gain access and once he gained access he could squirrel himself away inside and that's what he did and how would you describe his dead body anything striking um again i had been to innumerable homicide scenes before this uh he was on the bed on his back uh the gun next to him uh he had placed a gun to his head uh, messy, as you can imagine, uh, in terms of a homicide, but nothing, nothing unusual in terms of a suicide. Okay, so after he killed Versace, the media attention like skyrocketed from zero to a hundred in like one hour. Uh, did the media pressure have an impact on the investigation? I don't know that it had a real impact. Uh, I mean, certainly. Uh, the bosses um, felt pressure, chief of police, the state attorney, uh, law enforcement supervisors uh, felt pressure because they were constantly getting uh, messages. Uh, the investigators uh, probably it worked to their advantage in the sense of getting his photograph out. 
uh, work to a sense where uh, if we needed folks to do things, they were always available. And a lot of homicides, you, you know, you, you sometimes go begging pillar to post to try to get somebody else to assist in it. We had a surfeit of, uh, of investigators uh, willing to help an agency. We had the city of Miami Beach. We had the Miami-Dade Police Department. The FBI was engaged. Uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement was engaged. Uh, so we had more than enough resources uh, to do our job and, and to do the work. But uh, did somebody worry that uh, that law that law enforcement was being intimidated by the media? Not at all. Well, Michael, this is all that I have for you. I think we covered the case very well. And let's not forget that this was a dramatic case in which six people died because he killed five people and then he killed himself. That's something that nobody wanted. No, nobody had, look, nobody wanted the first person killed, the second, third, fourth, or certainly not uh, um, Mr. Versace, who, you know... Um, not that his life is worth any more of the other individuals uh, who were killed, uh, but he was a, a force of nature. He created uh, a, a remarkable fashion empire, and from all accounts, he was a generous, empathetic, giving individual. Uh, the world is somewhat lesser because of him. But again, for the folks who uh, were uh, the family and friends of Mr. Meglin, the caretaker in New Jersey, or the two folks in uh, Minnesota, their world had also became lesser because of their losses. Michael, many thanks for your time and for your very pre precious explanations that gave a very good uh, overview uh, of this case to my viewers. So Thanks for your time again. Uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, enjoy and thank you for inviting me uh, to your show. I appreciate it, Leonardo. Thanks everybody else for watching this and see you all next time. Bye-bye.